Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Jazakum Allah khairan all for coming to this session of the Islam 101 for New Muslims course. Inshallah, we are being joined by uh, various members of the community, uh, new Muslims. We have some youth as well as uh, we have people who are uh, born Muslims. So alhamdulillah, uh, this is good. Um, from looking at uh, the last feedback, um, I've seen that uh, there wasn't much feedback, so alhamdulillah, we'll continue with the idea of going a bit slower, uh, as well as trying to be more engaged. Um, I have muted uh, everyone just so that uh, the recording is good uh, for the future, inshallah. Uh, but I'm monitoring the chat, uh, and inshallah, once we get to the question and answers, if anybody wants to uh, speak up, uh, they can unmute themselves. So today we're going to be talking about the belief in God and uh, the angels. Uh, and these are the first two articles of faith. Uh, today's agenda is uh, very meaty. Uh, however, it is very, very beautiful. Uh, we're going to go slow and we're going to see how far we're going to get through it. I don't want to go through things really fast. Uh, but uh, we'll see, inshallah, how far we're going to get. We'll talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty. Uh, we'll start with the description. We'll talk about the idea of the 99 names. Uh, we'll talk about Allah, the name of God. We'll talk about God and gender, and then we'll speak about fear and hope, and then we'll end that section with the types of worship uh, according to Imam al Nawawi. Uh, may Allah have mercy upon his soul. And then we're going to go into the angels, the believing in the angels. Uh, we'll talk about the relationship uh, between the angels and humans. We'll talk about who are the angels and describe them. And then we'll talk about few uh, angels. Uh, or types of angels that are mentioned in the Islamic tradition. And we'll end with a practical approach to how to engage uh, with the angels. So we are still in Hadith Jibril that asked four questions. The first one is about Islam. The second one is about Iman. And the third one is about Ihsan. And the fourth one is about the hour or the hereafter. And from that, we derived this little table right here that uh, categorizes Islam into three co different components. Islam, which deals with the worship, Iman, which deals with the belief, and Ihsan, which de deals with the excellence. In today's lecture, we're going to start on the section of Iman. Um, and Iman, uh, as we said, it affects our thoughts, and it deals with the human component that is the mind. Uh, the specific science that deals with belief or theology is called Aqidah. And the ultimate purpose behind this whole category right here is to get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to get to know God Almighty uh, on a deeper level. In the last session, uh, we talked about the knowledge roadmap as well as the dimensions of the faith. And we started with this roadmap right here, and we described how, from an Islamic perspective, the different sciences are derived. Uh, and then we landed on the Sharia sciences, and then we said that this whole course is covering these three aspects, the fundamentals. However, there is so much more to cover uh, in, in the Islamic tradition. And we said that it is important that any learning that we do for the faith, we want to turn it into experiencing the faith. We don't want it just to remain intellectual. We actually want it to become spiritual and practical as well as intellectual. We had a little exercise um, about how when someone miscategorizes an aspect of the faith, uh, how that can actually result in a damage. Um, and inshallah, you can see the recording if you haven't, or watch the recording if you weren't at, uh, in that lesson. Uh, it's a very important exercise to go through. Uh, and then from there, we started to dive a bit deeper into what Islam is, what Iman is, what Ihsan is, and what the hereafter or the hour is. And that led us to this diagram right here that basically says that understanding that there is a hereafter uh, will constantly be pushing us towards this uh, sweet spot right here in the middle. Um, hence, we wouldn't be only practicing the worship component, uh, nor we will be practicing only the belief component, nor we will be practicing only the ihsan or the spirituality component. Because if we go extreme in any of these, uh, there is a side effect to it. For example, if somebody only does the worships and they don't have the spirituality or the belief, um, those worships, they can turn into just cultural practices. Same thing, if somebody merely has the belief but is not performing the worship or is not uh, realizing the importance of spirituality, that can lead to hypocrisy. And if somebody has only his life focused on spirituality but without groundedness in belief or, uh, and or worship, uh, they can go astray. 
and we mentioned some stories about um, about this. Uh, but today, inshallah, we'll start with the section or the category of Iman. And Iman, it, it means belief. And the purpose of it, as we said, is to get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to strengthen that connection with him. It is important to note that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he started his message in Mecca, he actually spent about 13 years in Mecca focusing on belief, on the idea of correcting the thoughts. Uh, how do we perceive this world? How do we perceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do we perceive our relationship with, uh, with humanity, with the environment, with nature, um, with the oceans? Um, there was a lot of focus on, um, uh, on belief um, to build that solid uh, ground. Um, once the Prophet, peace be upon him, immigrated with the Muslims to Medina, uh, which was due to the torture of the Meccan people to the Muslims, uh, there were a lot of jurisprudence, a lot of worship, and a lot of laws that started to be revealed. So when we look at the idea of belief, um, all the things that we're going to be talking about, these are things that are constant. These are things that are basically non-changeable. There are six articles of faith or of Iman, um, and nobody, no two scholars will come and argue and say, okay, we're not going to believe in the messengers, for example because these are all considered constants or what's called a thawabit, they're not changeable. So believing in God, believing in the angels, believing in the books or the scriptures, in the messengers, in the hereafter and in decree, these six articles of faith, these are constant, and this will build our mental framework, our intellectual framework that allows us to go about uh, this life in the right direction. And inshallah today, we'll start with the, believing, with the belief in God. Now, Islam has a very uh, unique view uh, about uh, God, about the divine. Um, and I will use the word God here initially because all these images that we might have <clears throat> in our heads about God, as I'm speaking, they're going to start coming up and you're going to realize or you're going to recognize why I'm using the word God instead of Allah. We're going to start using Allah once we're done with this section, uh, but we want to get that foundation. Why is it important to basically embrace the Islamic view on the divine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he says, Laysa shay'un wa huwa al -basir. Like there is nothing like him, like God. And he is the all hearing and all seeing. And this uh, verse specifically is very foundational when we come to describe uh, God Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, because when I say the word God, uh, just the way we have grown up maybe in this society, there can be some images that come to our minds. And it is important to recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us there's nothing like him. So there is no way to imagine God. And we're going to come to recognize that once we realize the impossibility of comprehending God. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, uh, who was actually the best friend uh, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as well as the very first caliphate, the very first successor uh, after the Prophet, peace be upon him, passed away, he said in a piece of poetry, he said, He said, recognizing your inability to comprehend him, that is God, is in fact comprehending him. Because once we recognize that we're not able to, um, to imagine God, we have reached the conclusion that it is, that it is in fact impossible uh, to uh, comprehend him. And then he says, and attempting to imagine the essence of God can result in disbelief. Um, and why that is, is that if we try to think of God from a worldly perspective, for example, if we say, okay, God is... Uh, if somebody says God is maybe as big as or as tall as um, the CN Tower, um, then uh, if they continue to think like that, they might reach uh, the question, well, if God is only as tall or as big as the CN Tower, can he create something that is bigger than the CN Tower? And then if we say, okay, yep, yeah, there's no problem in that. Then the next question that might come well, can God create something that is so big that he himself cannot move? And now we're starting to dive into a danger zone because now we're, we're asking uh, questions that are related to this world's 
uh, laws, this creation uh, realm, and we're imposing those ideas upon an entity that is beyond this realm. So the mere question of asking, can God create a rock that is so big that he cannot move, is a question that is bound by the laws of this world. Because the idea of moving something is related to potentially gravity, to inertia, is related to um, the force that's applied on it, or the torque that somebody is, uh, is using on, on that thing. And all these things are within the realm of this world. And hence, now we're starting to compare some entity, God, that is beyond this realm to the laws that we are bound with in this, uh, in this world. And that's why Abu Bakr al-Sadiq is saying, once we comprehend, or once we realize and are aware that we cannot comprehend God, we have actually reached that, um, we have actually comprehended him. And as we said that God is beyond uh, this creation, let me give you another example, the idea of time. Time is something that governs this world. So if we start thinking about, well, how did God know the past and the present and the future? Now we are thinking about uh, how, or we're trying to uh, impose the laws of this world upon somebody or upon an entity that is beyond uh, this world. And hence, the moment we start to do that, we reach, uh, we will undoubtedly uh, think of something that is imperfect about the divine. And any thought that can come to our mind is actually governed by the laws of this world. It's, it's difficult to think of something that it's actually impossible to think of something that is beyond uh, this world. We can think of something that does not exist in this world. For example, uh, maybe the, um, like, um, like a unicorn. Um, but that thought itself is actually a combination of things is a, is a combination of entities that are within this world. Hence, it doesn't matter what components we bring from this world trying to make that perfect entity, we're not gonna be able to do that. And that's why the, uh, the Islamic faith has this very unique uh, perspective on the, on the divine, that it, there is nothing like him. It doesn't matter how, how much we try to imagine how many great components we try to put together, God is beyond this realm. And I'll give you a simple analogy here. If you have a piece of paper, on this piece of paper, you can only draw things in 2D, in two, dimen two dimensions. Now imagine you brought a Rubik's cube. Can you put this Rubik's cube on the paper, like in its 3D form? No, it's impossible. Even if you try to draw it from a certain perspective that shows the three-dimensional facts of it or the three-dimensional reality of it, you're still projecting it on 2D on a two-dimensional plane. Same thing, if you have a computer, a normal computer that thinks in zeros and ones, can that computer understand quantum computing, which talks about the infinite number of states that, uh, that the quantum can be in? No, that's not possible. And as a conclusion, how come some people would come and say that it is possible to imagine God where we only have something like 11 dimensions in this world, and God is beyond those 11 dimensions. So it, it, it is again impossible to imagine God uh, using any sort, of the, any sort of tools that we have uh, in this uh, world. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, God uh, Almighty, um, he is, he's not imaginable, um, but he is not void of attributes. So, what that means is that God Almighty had given us names about him and has given us attributes about him. But these names and attributes, it is, you cannot imagine, they don't um, instill images in one's mind. For example, when, when we talk about that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar-Rahman, that he is the merciful. We cannot imagine an entity that is in this world from that, from that name or the attribute of mercy. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, That God Almighty has 99 names, 100 but one. Whoever comprehends them enters paradise. 
and all these names that are uh, of God, that are that belong to God, like Ar Rahman, the Merciful, Al Alim, the the Knowing, Al Samir, the All Hearing, Al Hakim, the Wise. All these names, they themselves do not instill any sort of images in our mind. But the scholars discussed, and they said, is it only 99 names? So something that is very common between the Muslims is that God has only 99 names. And the scholars differed uh, on that. So one of the scholarly opinions is that God has only 99 names. And then they tried to write these 99 names. And the scholars differed which ones are names of God and which ones are not. Some other scholars, they said, no, God has more than 99 names. And this hadith, this prophetic tradition is saying that amongst them, there are 99 of them that if somebody understands and somebody lives by, then they will enter paradise. And how did they derive that? They derived it from two other prophetic sayings. The first one is a specific prayer, a specific supplication that the prophet, peace be upon him, taught us. And that supplication has a component that says, Oh God, I ask you by all your names, the names that you have taught to your people uh, or to some people and the names that you have kept to yourself. So what that means is that there are more names uh, and more attributes of God that were not given to us. That's the first prophetic saying. The second prophetic saying comes from a description of an event that happens in the day of judgment, in the hereafter, when we're all resurrected in the day of judgment. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he says that he goes and he prostrates to God. And then he prays to God using names that he never used and he, he was never aware of before. That God teaches him in that moment new names and new attributes that he uses to pray to God to. So when the scholars looked at these two prophetic sayings, they said that that means that God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has more than 99 names. However, if we're able to find those 99 amongst all of them and live by them, then we'll enter paradise. And what that means is that living by, by these names, it means to not just only learn them and memorize them, but to also change one's life so that it is in line with them. For example, when we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar-Rahman, He is the merciful. We, when we embody that name by understanding it, we are also merciful towards the creation the, of the divine. We're not harsh on the people. When we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Ghafoor, He's the forgiver, then we embody that name in our lives by forgiving people that wronged us. So these are some examples of what it means to live or to comprehend uh, these names and attributes. So as we said, all of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of God Almighty are beautiful and magnificent. And we use these names not only to live by them, but to also pray to God with them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَادْعُوهُ بِهَا And to Allah belong the best names, the beautiful names. Uh, so invoke him by them. And how could that be? An example is that, let's say I'm asking for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in my prayer, in my supplication, using the names such as Ar-Rahman or Al-Ghafoor, like the merciful and the forgiver. So I'm praying to God for mercy and forgiveness, and I'm using his attributes. I'm invoking these attributes that are in alignment with the prayer that I am praying with. Let's say, for example, I'm in need of financial help. I can use the, uh, the name Al-Ghani, the one who is self-sufficient. Um, maybe it can be roughly translated as the rich. And we could, we could pray to God using that name, Al-Ghani. Uh, and we include that in our prayer. Now let's look at the name Allah. Allah is the name of God. So right now I'm going to start using the word Allah uh, because Allah in, in and of itself, it actually cannot be translated. It, it, it is not gendered and it cannot be pluralized. And on top of that, it cannot invoke any specific images in our heads. Some people roughly tra translate Allah to God, 
but that's just a metaphorical translation. Allah cannot be translated. It's a name. And it's different from the word ilah. Ilah means a God, which has a plural of aliha. And, but the word Allah does not have any, it cannot be pluralized. Now, Allah is actually uh, used by the, the Arab Muslims, Christian, Christians, and Jews. So if you go to an Arab-speaking country and you, you, you invoke the word Allah, everybody knows who Allah is, that you're referring to the divine. And it is the name of the divine. Now we'll dive into a topic that is important, uh, especially in our uh, time right now. Uh, and especially in the turmoil of the idea of uh, trying to be gender neutral. Now, the question that is constantly imposed, and we find it whether it is in academic discussions or in amongst common people, um, you know, talking about it, is the gender of God and how, you know, religion tries to make God masculine. And actually, when I was young, I'll tell you a personal story. Um, I was very young. And for some reason, this question came to me and asked my dad. And I said, dad, is God a male or a female? And usually people like who grew up within a certain context, they don't think about that question. So my dad was dumbfounded. And he just looked at me and he said, hmm. Um, and then he said, God refers to himself in the Quran using the pronoun huwa. Huwa is the masculine pronoun. But my dad did not give me an answer. Later on, I grew, when I grew up, I, I realized that there are a few things to keep in mind. First of all, the idea of gender, this, this, this attribute is actually an attribute of creation which means that since God and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond creation, we cannot attribute gender to God. Also, the next question is that, why did God refer to himself as huwa in Arabic instead of hiya? Well, that is due to two things. The first thing is that the language itself, the genius of the language is that it uses the masculine pronoun as a default. And the second reason is that languages, even the Arabic language, they have limitations. So they're not limit like Arabic, you cannot describe something that is genderless. It's a, it's a gender based language. So you refer to things as hua or he, even inanimate objects like a car, inanimate like an it object is referred to it as the feminine using the feminine pronoun but that doesn't mean that we take that limitation and impose it on god we cannot use that biological characteristic or that attribute of creation uh, and impose it on god when we speak about allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what tends to happen is that, especially um, as people try to be more religious, they try to invoke the idea of fear of God instead of the hope in God. And whether we go one extreme or another, uh, we'll have issues. So I'll ask you a question right now and feel free to drop the answer in the chat. If somebody goes towards the extreme side of fear, of fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of fearing God, what can that result in? If somebody is, you know, they take the path of being extremely afraid of God, what would that end up, what, what would that take him or her? They might be afraid to repent, that's true, and anxiety, exactly, more fear, hate, depression, and anxiety, and even disbelief, absolutely. All these things, they result from being extremely afraid of God. What if we go to the other end of being extremely hopeful of God? What would that take us? If somebody... Yeah, complacency, that's true. That's one, uh, that's an answer. 
taking everything very simply. So um, Harun is saying peace and calm. Any other answers? Okay, they might be, yep, yeah, they might be negligent. That's true, Ted. And they might not ask for forgiveness. Wishfulness, very true, Rabia. That's absolutely right. If somebody goes to the um, Iman is saying happy. So the uh, not being careful of the actions, true. Muhammad is saying being content. So just like being extremely afraid of God, that can result in us being or falling in despair. Being extremely hopeful of God can actually result in us taking things for granted and not exerting any effort towards obeying God. And it can actually result in a sense of arrogance. And hence, when the scholars spoke about fear and hope of God, they said it is important to be balanced, to be in the middle. And they, they created an analogy and they said, imagine a bird. If a bird is flying, one wing is fear and one wing is hope. If you take any of those two wings, the bird would not be able to fly. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just knowing our nature, he wanted to push us towards or away from despair and more towards hope as much as possible. Because we have as human beings, generally a nature to be afraid to reach that despair position. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the tradition, he provided few things for us to continue to have that sense of hope. For example, if somebody does one good deed, they're given 10 times the reward up to 700 times. And if somebody does only one evil deed, it is marked as one. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can actually forgive it very quickly. For example, if somebody does one evil thing and then they immediately ask for forgiveness, then the angels don't write that. They immediately erase it. As well as that if somebody makes the intention of doing something good, but they don't get a chance to perform it, they still get one reward. Also, if somebody makes the intention of making, of doing one evil deed, but they purposely refrain from doing it, they still get one reward. And the idea behind that is to drive that hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and drive that sense of mercy and connection with the divine. And it really puzzles me when I see in, within the Muslim community the amount of fear that we try to instill in people, including in children, um, scaring them all the time of hellfire, scaring them of the punishment of God, without mentioning to them anything about the forgiveness of God, about the mercy of God, about the compassion of God, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we're going to mention fear, it is important that we also mention hope. And we have one scholar, his name is Imam al Um, and he attempted to kind of draw our attention to the different psyche of people. And he said that there are three types of worship. The first worship is that he called it the worship of the slaves. The second one, he called it the worship of the business men or the business people. And then the third one, he called it the worship of the lover. So he said the worship of the slaves is or addresses the psyche of people who they feel that it is important to be afraid of God in order for them to not err. For example, I had a friend and he was very clear. He said, my psyche or my way of thinking is that you need to remind me of the punishment of God so that I become better. Another type of people, they, what they do is that they don't really, um, like this idea of scaring them is not, is not what works with them. What works with them is the reward. So for example, you tell them fasting has a better reward, for example, than maybe praying uh, two rak'at uh, after dhuhr, for example. They would say, okay, I'll get more rewards by doing this, this deed than that deed. He's a cal he or she are a calculating mind, then they would say, okay, I'm going to get closer to God by doing this type of worship. 
so that I can collect more reward. Another type of worship, he called it the worship of the lover or the worship of the free. And what that means is that somebody worships God and obeys God and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just for the fact that he is Allah, that he is the divine. Not for anything else, but that he actually feels that strong connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he, he or she, they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much that they ultimately want to do everything that pleases him. And once somebody reaches that state, they will naturally abstain from any sort of evil and they will naturally do the good deeds. I'm mentioning this not with the idea that you need to categorize yourself into which one, but Imam Anawi, he mentioned this just to help us understand the psyche of the people that do the worship. I had a friend, if you go and you try to scare him of, the, of God, he would actually get further from God. But if you try to use the approach of the worship of the lover, he would get so close to God. So when we're talking about God, it is important to understand who we're talking with. And it is also important for us to understand that we as human beings, we fluctuate. So sometimes you really need to scare someone. Like for example, if person X, he is naturally a, a businessman. He's a very calculating person. But in some points in the day, or in his life, you might need to scare him in order to push him away from doing something that is extremely bad. I'll give you an example. Somebody came to one of the companions and he asked him, is there a forgiveness to somebody who killed? And that companion, uh, he, he looked at the person and he said, yes. In the same setting, somebody else walked in and he said, can, does God forgive somebody who kills? And that companion said, no. So the person beside him, he said, how come you tell one person yes and the other person no? He said, I saw in the eyes of the first person extreme sadness, which means that I've detected he has already committed that crime. I, don't, I didn't want him to fall into despair. But the other person, I detected extreme anger in his eyes as if he's about to go and kill someone. So I had to deter him. I had to scare him. And he used the approach of the punishment. So it is important for us to recognize uh, these aspects. Let me talk right now about the angels. The angels, believing in the angels is the second article of Iman, the second article of faith. And the angels, they're very special beings. They have actually a very strong connection with humanity from the beginning of the creation where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded some of the angels to prostrate to Adam uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam. Since that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has dedicated or had dedicated many angels to perform tasks in this world for humanity as well as for this world. And since the time of inception, uh, conception of the human being in, uh, in his or her mom's womb, the angels get involved in protecting that, uh, that fetus. Um, they get involved in actually bringing the soul from the divine to that fetus after a certain amount of time has passed. And then they pray for humanity. And they have the tasks of actually uh, not only blowing the soul in or bringing the soul to that body, but also to seize it when the time is up. They have the responsibilities of delivering the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messages and the scriptures from him to the messengers in this world. They actually have the task of protecting human being, beings, as we'll talk about um, after a little bit of time uh, or in, in uh, in, the, in a later slide. They have also the task of documenting what each human being does, the good and the bad. And it surprises me how the amount of publications that are out there about the angels is very rare. And what many people focus on is publish, publishing things about the demons, the shayateen, the devils. 
like if you go on any YouTube channel or if you do some search on Google or YouTube, you'll be able to find things about um, being possessed by shayateen, by the devils and by the demons. And you would find extreme descriptions about, you know, the shayateen, about the devils. And sometimes it goes into the realm of being absolutely incorrect. But when you look for things about the angels, it's very rare. Even when you look at it in, um, as contemporary publications in, uh, in Arabic, um, they're very rare to find. Yes, everything is documented in the Quran and in the, uh, in the old scholarly books, but for contemporary things, it's very hard to find. And I was really happy to see Dr. Omar Suleiman. He has a full series about the angels, about these amazing beings. And I recommend that people actually go and watch it. Now, the angels, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that they're created from light. We as human beings were created from wet soil, uh, from this earth, and the angels are created from light. And these angels or these creatures, they actually have free choice. But the choices that they have, they're limited by the boundaries of the obedience of the divine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, يَخَافُونَ رَبَّهُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِهِمْ وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ That they fear their Lord and they do as they're commanded. We know from the Quran that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to create Adam, peace be upon him, the angels asked God. They had a conversation with God. The tradition also tells us that the angels, they actually discuss things amongst themselves. They're not complete. They're not agents with no agency. They're not, they're not creatures with no agencies. They have their own agencies. It's just that the choices that the realm or the space of choices that they have, it does not go beyond the, uh, or beyond the obedience of God. And I like to use the word free choice as opposed to using the word free will because naturally any creation in this world, it has choices. It does not have free will. A lot of people, they say humans have free will. Well, here's a question for you. Can you go and fly? Like you would like, you have the will to fly. Why don't you just go on top of a mountain and try to fly? You wouldn't be able to do that. And hence, you're limited by choices. We have free choices. We can make these choices. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the choice of obeying him or disobeying him, but these still remain within the reality of the choices of this world. Same thing with the angels. They have choices, but their choices are limited by obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The angels, they get depicted in TV and in pop culture, either as these cute females that fly using butterfly wings, or they get depicted as these uh, males that are in constant conflict with God. I'll give you an example. There's a show called <clears throat> um, Angels and Demons. And the angels are depicted in that show as... Uh, as male, the main characters uh, as male, as men, but they depict them as being in constant uh, struggle with the commandment of God. It is important to know that the angels, this special creation, they don't eat, they don't drink, they don't procreate, and they do not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, they are genderless. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, actually describes in the Quran how the disbelievers, many of the disbelievers, including at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, they assigned the gender of female to the angels. And then they assigned the angels to be the daughters of God. And on top of that, they themselves do not like to have daughters as offspring. They would like sons. So that shows to what level um, some people can go to. They don't only assume that the angels are gendered. They assume that the female gender is considered not as ideal. And they assign the, those, that gender or the, or the offspring of that gender to the divine. All this is wrong. The angels are genderless. They don't drink, they don't, they don't procreate, but they are described as very beautiful. And the tradition describes 
um, some of the attributes of the angels in mesmerizing ways. Um, and these angels, they can take forms. Uh, we also know that they die, but we don't know how or when they die. But we know that at the end of time, every creation will die, including these angels. In one of the chapter, in, cha in the chapter of Fatr, um, the surah of, of Fatr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alhamdulillah, Fatr is Samawati wal Ard, Jail in Malaikati Rusulan, Uli Ajnihat in Methna, Wathulatha, Waruba, Yazidu fil Khalki Mayasha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising himself and he's saying, All praise is due to Allah who created the angels and made them into messengers and made them having wings of twos and threes and fours. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates more. And this is important that the angels, they come in different, um, in different shapes. For example, Gabriel, we'll talk about him in a bit. He has 600 wings and he is actually the master head of the angels. The tradition describes that the angels are actually very large in numbers. For example, the prophet, peace be upon him, on the journey of ascension, he was told that 700,000 or 70,000 angels, they perform pilgrimage at a place that's called Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur. It's in the seventh heaven. And Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur means the, the often frequented house. And, and 70,000 of these angels perform that pilgrimage daily and they never go back to, uh, to it. So only once. So imagine every day, 70,000, 70,000. That tells you how many angels that are out there. Basically an infinite number. It's beyond what we can comprehend. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them many tasks in the dominion, in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of these tasks and some of these angels are described. So for example, we have general names of groups of angels like Al-Ashhad, the witnesses. وَيَوْمَ يَقُومُ الْأَشْهَادِ and, and in the day that the witnesses would stand up. Another one is Al-Mala'i Al-A'la, the exalted assembly. assembly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes also a group of angels as soldiers, Al-Junood. Also as safara the ambassadors, messengers, Al-Rusul. So there are some general names that are described in the tradition for the angels. There are some specific names as well, like for example, Jibril, Gabriel, Mikal, Michael, Israfil, Raphael, Munkar wa Nakir, Haruta wa Marut. All these are specific names for angels. There are also some general tasks, like for example, Hamalatul Arsh, the carriers of the throne, or the honorable recorders, Al Kiram al Katibun. Al Kiram al Katibun. There are also specific tasks, like we have an angel with a specific task. His, his task um, is to blow the trumpet. Uh, so his, his task is the trumpet blower. Sahib al-Qarm. There is a specific angel for mountains. His name is, or his task is being the angel of mountains. We have the revelation angel, who's actually Gabriel, Jibreel, peace be upon him. He has that specific task to take care of. So what we're going to do is that we're going to look at some of these angels and we'll describe some of them. Um, but that doesn't cover all the types of angels that are mentioned in the tradition. The first angel is Gabriel, Jibril, peace be upon him. And he is actually the headmaster of all angels. He receives the commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then he distributes that commandment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him, إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كريم. He describes the message that this uh, honorable uh, or noble messenger had took it. And that honorable messenger, he's Jibreel. ذي قوة عند ذي العرش مكين. He has extreme power. And he actually has a status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the owner of the throne. مطاعن ثم أمين. He is obeyed in the realm of the angels. And he is also trustworthy. He is the angel of revelation. And he carries the messages from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the messengers. All the messengers, including Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he is described as very beautiful and very majestic. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, when he used to see him, he used to see him 
usually as a man. And it is said that he used to come in, in the shape of a man called Dihya al-Kalbi, who was a very handsome man. But the Prophet saw him in his natural form twice. One time is at a mountain called Mount Jiyad in Mecca. And the second one is at what's called Sidrat al-Muntaha, the utmost boundary, which is in the seventh heaven when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the companionship of Jibreel all the way up to the seventh heaven. Okay, I, I would like to stop here just so that I can give you a chance to uh, ask any questions, inshallah. Um, we have few things to, to cover, but uh, we'll cover them, inshallah, next time. I don't want to go too quick. Um, unless nobody has any questions, then we can continue, inshallah. So, Jazakumullah khairan. Uh, let me know if you have any uh, questions, and uh, inshallah, I'll try to answer them.